Thank you, everybody. It's great to be back here um, after this morning's session about uh, not asking for anything in return. So this is just me giving it to you, and you can then shout back at me. Um, I agreed with everything Sandra said, and now I'm going to tell you as to how terrifying it is that it's practically impossible in the present climate to make it happen. And then we can unpick all that. Uh, if I was talking to you 20 or 30 years ago, I would be saying, yes, trade will bring peace because it creates wealth, the wealth is distributed, and our priority is to increase our living standards, educate our children, and buy a motorcycle for our grandson and all the rest of it. In the past five years, that has gone out the window and been reversed. And what has happened now is that what you want to call populism, nationalism, this idea of sovereignty or of identity, is superseding what we used to think was higher living standards and a higher quality of life. And I'm going to very quickly, um, but not in a rushed way, take you through three areas of the world in the past month or so that has proven this. And from that, we'll see how dangerous it is. So in the past month or so, there have been elections in Europe, elections in India, South Asia, those elections, and there's been stuff going on in East Asia. Each of those has been predicated on populism or nationalism. And since we're talking about peace, each of them has a huge impact on keeping the world safe. Uh, many of you, I presume, know this thing called Brexit, uh, which is confusing me at, at the moment. In the European elections, the populists, for want of a better thing, and I'll say that for the last time, uh, were up to 29% of the vote. In, uh, I think it was in France, Italy, and Britain, they won in the European Parliament outright majorities. Now, these are people that are challenging the basis of the European Union, which 70 or so years ago, as we heard, was set up particularly to create trade between France and Germany and smaller countries, and that became the European Union. And that has kept peace with us for the past 70 years. And with that peace comes security, because here we have NATO, which that military and political element is embedded there. So you cannot have a political situation that doesn't mesh with a military situation. Now, I'm talking here domestically, I know we're very international here, as what they call a Remainer. As we go around the world on this thing, you will have, uh, you know, there's pro and anti Modi, there's pro and anti China and all that. I'm not talking about the individuals involved in this, I'm talking about the mechanism that brings them into, into power. So, in Britain, let's just have a look at what's been going on here. Because we were given a referendum and not a parliamentary vote, it means that the wishes of the people were what you'd call barroom or mob wishes, stuff that is very difficult to implement, uh, but you want to bring back hanging, you want free love, you want whatever, yes, you tick the box. And essentially, in order to address that momentum that's coming in, and it's a huge momentum here, uh, the politicians that were used to be the mainstream are veering in that direction on both sides. <clears throat> so our Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, who's a, who's a prime ministerial uh, contender, tried to get votes by comparing the European Union to the Soviet Union. Now, all of us here know that's not correct. But if you're listening to it down there, you're not really into politics and that you hear that, he's a politician, he's telling the truth. Dan Hannan, who is a member of the European Union Parliament, said that the British people should be ashamed of losing the Battle of Hastings in 1066. And after that, Britain became, Englishness became a badge of subjugation. Now, I'm a foreign correspondent. I didn't explain myself, as Rita said. And I came back yesterday from the Balkans, from Zagreb. Uh, in the Balkan War, they kept going back to the Battle of Kosovo, I think, in 1839, which the Serbs lost to the Albanians, and therefore they had to get their brilliance back. Pol Pot did it in Cambodia. 
any politician that tells you to go back to history to revert a wrong that was done hundreds or thousands of years ago is not a politician looking to the future. That's a politician looking to the past. But they get lots of votes. So we've heard from Boris Johnson, another favorite. He compared the EU's regional ambitions to those of Napoleon and of Hitler. Now, when you get that happening, and you get us leaving the European Union, a number of defense arrangements that have kept the peace naturally disintegrate. I won't go into the details, but they do. Let's move across to South Asia. And again, I say this isn't a particular person. It's to do with political mechanisms. Narendra Modi just won an unexpected majority of votes. His basis is on Hindu nationalism. And it's worked, you know, well or unwell, we don't know. But in order to bolster that and get those votes in, he has to appeal to that base. And in one of those instances there, we've heard the hard line against Pakistan is continuing. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into the Pakistan stuff and all the rest, but I'll just say this. The politicians need to win grassroots nationalist votes. But they cannot win those if they have long-term peace with a neighbor that threatens that sovereignty and nationalism. And that is why in, in Britain, we are moving towards making an enemy of the European Union. And in India, they, it's not moving towards, they are retaining uh, you know, this thing with Pakistan that's been going on for 70 years since the partition. And it's a grim scenario. And now I'm going to take you to the final place in Northeast Asia. Uh, because, and oh, I just wanted to say that India is, as the rise of China comes up, India is expected to be or wants to be part of this sort of democratic thing, you know, with Japan and with, with uh, the US and with whoever, America and all the rest of it. That can't happen if they're constantly focusing on war with Pakistan. Yeah. So you're not going to get that security umbrella in Asia that you've had in Europe, which is in any case threatened with disintegration. So East Asia. East Asia is the great success story of bringing Western-style democracy to a non-European society. It started with Japan, it moved to South Korea, and it went to Taiwan. These are three impoverished, war-ridden places that are now first world economies. The rise of China doesn't necessarily mean an enemy's rising up, but there's a sort of momentum to balance that rise somehow. A very natural way to balance that rise would be for there to be some sort of alliance pioneered between Japan and South Korea, the two beneficiaries of the Western economic order and the Western democratic government. But there's not. Why? Because they haven't forgotten or forgiven what happened in the Second World War. So the issue of South Korean comfort women the supposed lack or real lack of Japanese apology, whatever you want to do is stopping Asia forming its own independent alliance of uh, economic or military. If you could do that, then the Philippines would join, Thailand would join, Singapore would join, and there would be a, it wouldn't be NATO, but it would be similar along those lines. What's happening at the moment with that? Every strand of defense and trade up to a point goes to the Pentagon. So South Korea goes to the Pentagon, Tokyo goes to the Pentagon, Philippines goes to the Pentagon, Thailand goes to the Pentagon. And then what's the narrative on that? Is from Beijing, they say, well, the US is creating a new Cold War. What should the narrative be is that Asia is creating its own entity like Europe did that can balance a rising power so that hegemony and colonialization or whatever doesn't take place. Out of those three regions, two common threads to me have appeared. One is that in order to get votes, 
politicians focus on the hostility of a neighbor. So in South Korea, it's Japan. Japan is probably South Korea or China. Here, it's Europe, etc. And it's not rooted in the competing visions of the future. It's rooted in the unresolved differences of the past. So Dan Hannon talks about the Battle of Hastings, Hitler, Napoleon. It's not saying, where do we want to be 30 years from now? And that voters, this is crucial, are choosing, knowing that their living standards are going to drop, they are voting for these politicians. Now, getting back to trade, which you're, you, you guys are so good at, and business, that's all ticking along. But unless we sort out this electoral mess that we're in, whereby, I don't know how to say it, the world order at the moment is based on this electoral democracy as we have it at the moment. It is delivering, a, a, in my view, a destructive element where governments are becoming withdrawn. Uh, America's creating these, you know, an enemy out of Mexico, enemy out of China, all of the rest of it. So how do we get around that? Because we need to return to the fact that trade can produce peace. And that was the mantra in the late 1940s, 1950s. It brought Japan out, it brought South Korea out, it brought Taiwan out. It's, it brought all of those East European countries in after the Cold War. And I've just come back, as I said, from Croatia. If you think the Irish border here, those that have follow it, is a problem, Go and look at the maps in Yugoslavia. They've got real problems over there. That is as fragile as they come. I don't think I should add much more to that. I think I've, I've got a sort of stuff here about, you know, peace and everything, but there's not gonna be peace unless we sort this out. And I don't think that it's possible to sort it out in this little room, but I think it's possible to, by word of mouth, to spread that message. And Angelina, we had a conversation before, didn't we? Where I told her that I thought that, we're going off piece a bit here, but I'll just say it to me, that I thought that the, uh, the way that South Sudan was created by the international community was one of the greatest acts of negligence. Why? Because they hadn't yet got over this idea that tribes and clans give them weapons, will fight each other because they believe they got vested interests. And that's what's happening now in the developed world with us. If you listen to Boris Johnson, if you listen to Donald Trump, if you listen to some of the rhetoric coming out of Japan or South Korea, it doesn't matter which side, they are saying we can be a great nation again and we don't need our neighbors, but they do need their neighbors. Thank you very much.